have accepted those three things, that you don't know what love is, you don't know what pleasure is, and you don't know what success is, then indeed you are materially exhausted and you can easily approach Krishna. <coughs> oh, as Kunti Devi says, Tom Akinshina Gotra, he's easily approached. She addressed Krishna directly. You're easily approached by those who are materially exhausted. Whereas those who are puffed up by material opulences, they cannot approach you with feeling. So the material opulences, Janma, good birth, Aishwarya wealth, Shruta, learning, Sri, personal duty, these opulences magnify your sense of knowing what you're doing and feeling competent. And that confidence comes out in your belief, your assumption that you know what is love, you know what is pleasure, and you know what success is. So we can examine ourselves to see how much we have bought in to materialistic conceptions. Consciously or subconsciously. And therefore there are impediments in our approaching Krishna. Mm. And Bhagavatam is the literary presence of Krishna. Especially meant for Kali Yuga. Remember the question asked in the first canto by the sages of Nainasarana? They asked Sutta Goswami, what are we going to do? Krishna has departed for his own abode. How will the world understand what is dark? And the answer they received was, Srimad Bhagavatam has arisen brilliant as the sun. It will dispel all the darkness. Again, in order to approach Krishna, and that means in order to approach the Bhagavatam, indeed, to maximally approach the Hare Krishna mantra, we need to abandon our false confidence that we know what is love, we know what is pleasure, and we know what is success. If you can toss those notions out of your life, you save yourself so much trouble. It is the nature of the conditioned soul to clutch on to things. And I know. <laughs> There's some things I know. I mean, I know everything, but... <laughs> I have experience. To truly be materially exhausted means that you're willing to jettison your conceptions. And that way you can quickly become purified. Instead of holding on to material conceptions, we want to hold on to Krishna's lotus feet. And holding on to Krishna's lotus feet means holding on to devotional service in the association of devotees, hearing and chanting about Krishna is the foundation of all devotional service. Vidura and Uddhava, their paths have just crossed. The situation is very dramatic and very overwhelming. Both of them know what's going on, that the Yadu dynasty has departed, Krishna has departed. Both of them are aware of that. Yet, you see, Bhagavatam is full of spiritual culture, so, <laughs> in such a situation of calamity, the disappearance of the Yadu dynasty and, of course, the disappearance of Lord Krishna, in that kind of situation, you don't immediately just cut to the chase as one would do in the cultures we are familiar with today. You gracefully and gradually approach the very troublesome matter at hand. 
So, Vidura actually knew that the other dynasty and Krishna had departed. But, the shock is so great for him that he, even though he knows, he doesn't know. In other words, he hasn't processed it yet, we would say. He knows, but he hasn't fully assimilated. Therefore, he's asking, he's asking Uddhava about all the Yadus. You'll see so many verses coming up in which the door asks about this Yadu, that Yadu. Although Vidura knows they're gone. But basically, in other words, he's asking for support and help. Let's try to process this great calamity together. That's basically what he's saying. So even though he's asking questions about all the members of the Yadu dynasty, he knows they're gone. But he's, it's the nature of responding to tragedy that you seek ways how to process the situation gradually. And so Bhagavatam is full of grace, Bhagavatam is full of poise, it's full of finesse. And that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing spiritual culture, real culture. You're seeing the utmost finesse in relations. You might say, the first inquiry that Vidura makes is about Krishna and Balaram. He asks, are they doing well? They're the elevators of everyone's prosperity. Are they doing well in the house of Shura Singh? Are they doing well in that dynasty? How can you ask about the welfare of the Supreme Personality of Godhead? If Vidura is actually one who knows the absolute truth, and certainly Uddhava is, knowing the Supreme Absolute Truth, then why would Vidura ask about the welfare of the Supreme Absolute Truth? He's doing it out of prema, out of pure love. Krishna is self-sufficient. He needs no one to look after his welfare. Yet, out of love, the devotees ask about Krishna's welfare. We spoke a few days ago about how love is the topmost dynamic in the topmost portion of the spiritual world. Not our material conceptions of what is right and what is wrong. We briefly discussed how when Krishna gazes upon the beautiful young lady so written down. Sometimes he becomes so overwhelmed that he starts milking a bull instead of a cow. And his dear most consort, Srimati Radharani, she sometimes becomes bewildered, blinded by love, and embraces a tamal tree because the color of the tamal tree resembles Krishna. Is this a mistake? No, the topmost principle of Niloka Vrindavan is pure love. We discussed, remember, about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu seeing a sand dune as he walked on the beach at Jamanapuri. But he mistook it for a Govardhan hill and started running toward it. Is that a mistake? No, that is the way of pure love, that you see the beloved everywhere. Similarly, out of pure love, Vidura is asking about the well-being of Krishna and Mama, even though they don't need anyone to ask about their well-being.
we read in the purport, without the grace of the Lord, no one can become happy and prosperous. Because the happiness of the family of the Lord's devotees depends on the happiness of the Lord, the door first of all inquired about the well-being of the Lord. So besides Vidura is being affected by Prema, and therefore he's asking about the well-being of the supreme self-sufficient one, uh, he's also, Vidura is acknowledging that we can only be indirect enjoyers. Now this is a tough pill to swallow. You can just feel your conditioning rising up in you. You are the direct enjoyer. You can feel that. For so many births, this conditioning has been with us. Yet it is the source of all our problems. This contamination, this fever that burns in us to directly be the enjoyer. It's something that can only be purified at the root by immersion in selfless devotional service based on hearing and chanting about Krishna. In that way, the disease will be destroyed at the root. Otherwise, not possible. And you can just feel the enormous habits built up over the years. Oh, the lifetimes. That happiness means I directly enjoy. With my mind and my senses, I interact with what's around me. And if that interaction is favorable for my gratification, that means I'm enjoying. So conditioned life means to be affected by this illusion that I just reach out. Enjoyment is there directly. <laughs> it's a total mirage. Common example given is like the hand lustily looking at it, the loves you man, and thinking, ah, yeah, the hand is the enjoyer. And the hand grabs the gloves you man and squeezes it to enjoy it. <laughs> Can the hand enjoy the gloves you man that way? I got it. The hand thinks it's all, it's my gloves you man. Feel that juice. <laughs> it's an illusion. In order for the hand to relish the glovemen, what does it have to do? It has to bring the glovemen to the mouth. And then, when the glovemen goes into the stomach and is assimilated, the whole body feels nourished. In that way, the hand is the indirect enjoyer of the glovemen. So what is your hand going to do? Go on strike? If I cannot directly enjoy the glumjumin, forget it, I'm not bringing it to the mouth. No, it is the constitutional position of the hand to assist the whole body by bringing the food to the mouth, which is the authorized place for food <laughs> to be processed. Similarly, we cannot be direct enjoyers. And the whole bhakti process is meant to work on our contamination. That enjoyment is there. I just reach out with my mind and senses. This is the depth of ignorance. And this is what's troubling us. So if we're going to cleanse that contamination, we really need an aggressive program <laughs> to recuperate our health, to regain our health. <clears throat> you can't take it casually. Yeah, so I think I'm the direct enjoyer. It happens, you know. <laughs> After all, everyone's like that. What do you want out of me? No, you have to be proactive, recognizing the disease and working on it. And then we can enter more deeply into this statement that 
Because the happiness of the family of the Lord's devotees depends on the happiness of the Lord, Vidura first of all inquired about the well-being of the Lord. Just think, you, you're dependent on someone else's happiness. You don't like that. Materialist society trains you to think you are the independent enjoyer. Your happiness depends on you. Shape your life. Be all that you can be. <laughs> Adjust, arrange, manage, organize for you. And if situations and persons don't fit your program for happiness, you know what to do. Get rid of them. Throw them out. This is our conditioning, which is so deep in this age of color. Even India now is being overloaded with this kind of mentality. <clears throat> to realize that we are dependent on someone else's happiness. We are dependent on Krishna being pleased. And to please Krishna, as we spoke the other day, that pleasing Krishna depends on pleasing Krishna's devotee. In this section of Bhagavatam, you're going to read about the interactions between these two greatest devotees, Vidura and Lord. After Vidura concludes his long list of inquiries about particular members of the Yahoo dynasty, He's going to ask again. Oh friend, oh my friend, please therefore chant the glories of the Lord, who is meant to be glorified in the places of pilgrimage. So he's the doors made his presentation, beginning with asking about the welfare of Krishna Bhagavan and then asking about so many members of the Yadu dynasty, and then he concludes his presentation by saying, now, my dear friend, please chant Krishna's glories. What happens? Uddhava is silent. He's frozen. Because by hearing Madhura's questions about Krishna, Uddhava suddenly remembers intensely, more intensely than usual, his feelings of separation from Krishna. So he freezes, he's silent. Srila Vishwanath Chakwari Thakur says, Buddha is silent for 48 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> he knows. <laughs> Buddha was actually not present in the material world. Because just by hearing inquiries about Krishna, Buddha's consciousness is in the topmost planet of the spiritual world. And particularly, he's in Dwarka, on Krishna Loka. Just by hearing the questions about Krishna. How is that possible? What is the technological mechanism by which this is happening? The mechanism is that remembrance of Krishna is the same as the presence of Krishna. This is what Buddha was demonstrating. This is how powerful bhakti is. By hearing the questions from Vidura, Uddhava remembered Krishna more intensely it's not that he ever forgot Krishna, but it's just that the subject matter of Krishna is newer and newer at every moment. So the questions of the door provoked a further expansion of Uddhava's Krishna consciousness. So much so that Uddhava lost consciousness of his presence on the earthly realm and was absorbed in being a Dwarka in Krishna Loka. <coughs> These are the mysteries of Bhagavatam. This is the power of the Bhakti.
lofty spiritual technology, which is unsurpassed. It's not about religious belief. Buddha was actually transported by way of the mechanism of remembering Krishna. And then, after a period of time, Buddha is once again present in this realm. And he delivers his dramatic opening words. Krishna Jumani Nimloche. What does that mean? The sun, S-U-N. The sun of the world has set. And our house, meaning the Yadu dynasty, has been swallowed by time. Very most beautiful artistic way of saying Krishna is God and the Yadu dynasty is God. Krishna Jumani Nimloche. The sun of the world. That orb that illuminates everything has set. In other words, we are all now plunged in darkness. And the unsurpassable Yadu dynasty has been swallowed by the snake of time. What more can I say? The more we read this section of the Bhagavatam, the more we're able to feel those dynamics. It's in, super intense. And notice Uddhava's maximally cultured reply. Even in relaying the conclusion, which Vidura already knew, but still. Even in relaying that conclusion, Uddhava is speaking with maximum artistry. <laughs> the sun of the world has set. What more can be said? We are now plunged in darkness. <clears throat> Another point in the verse today is Krita Shino, the elevators of everyone's prosperity. How is it that our prosperity depends on Krishna and Balara? Our prosperity, according to the materialistic mindset, depends on our own endeavors. Prosperity depends on which political party you put in office. <laughs> Just like now, the new Prime Minister of India is promising prosperity. I'll take away all the barriers to business, just like I did in Gujarat. <laughs> Prosperity will have it all over it. <laughs> and people are so foolish. They think that prosperity depends on politicians or economists. <laughs> and then when they hear Shiva Bhagavatam, that the elevators of everyone's prosperity <laughs> are Krishna and Bhagavan. Please be practical. We believe in God. We worship the gods. We put a little something in the movie. But how is it that prosperity depends on Krishna and Bhagavan? As a practical reality. How can that be? The great illusion that human society operates under is that Prosperity and happiness can be achieved by skillful manipulation of matter. <laughs> if you know the right process for manipulating matter, you can generate prosperity and happiness. They think this so much that even in their dealings with nature, they treat nature like it's inanimate, <laughs> mechanical matter. In this way, believing Human beings are the, their own key to prosperity. They plunge the world into more and more chaos, economically, politically, 
environmentally. But because some parts of the world temporarily seem to be a little bit enjoying, you forget about the suffering that's in most of the world. The sufferings that people take for granted in most parts of the world, we'd be horrified by if they happened here. <coughs> Just like I've been communicating with devotees in Ukraine, because the part of Ukraine where all that trouble is now, I would regularly travel in. So, civilians are being killed in this civil war. Women and children. You see video clips of apartment buildings devastated by military warfare. And then, of course, one Malaysian Airlines passenger plane was flying high in the air far above the conflict, but evidently the rebels shot it down, thinking it was the Ukrainian government seeking to attack them. 300 people dead. 300 people on their way from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur. Never thinking anything like that would happen. So devotees were writing me. Amidst all this going on, uh, that they were describing their situation. Uh, we're having a little problems, and we're having a few problems in our area. A little bit of political instability. <laughs> they always use that term, political instability. So therefore, Maharaj, we realize you can't come due to this few problems we're having here and the political instability. <laughs> they are so accustomed to, to living in what we call bad karma alley in between Russia and Germany. <laughs> <laughs> and they're so used to being kicked around and obliterated that even when you know, all this uh, <clears throat> chaos and all these hostilities are going on, all this combat, there's a little bit of political instability in our area. <laughs> so it just shows you that the different standards of heaven and hell. <laughs> <laughs> So because such things are not happening at this time in Australia, we think, oh, life is good. <clears throat> you look at a place like Singapore, prosperous, but how many of you would have wanted to live in Singapore less than 100 years ago, 70 years ago? The place was totally hellish. At the epicenter of World War II in the Pacific. Mm -mm. But fortunes change, and then everybody thinks, oh, now everything is nice. <laughs> Shri Bhagavatam gives us a perspective on the age of Kali that is so important to you. Otherwise, we're so quick to lose our vision in the dense darkness of Kali Yuga. We must have this light. And by hearing Srimad Bhagavatam and hearing the reactions of Krishna's devotees to whatever Krishna does, we develop affinity, we develop attraction for our natural position as secondary or indirect enjoyers. The position becomes attractive to us once again. <clears throat> Let Krishna enjoy first and we take the remnants. 
Krishna's enjoyment is the only priority. That's the Vrindavan principle. They don't know anything else in Vrindavan except Krishna's enjoyment. All right, any questions? Yes. Much. I'm desperate to get out of this material world. Mm. Please keep on enlightening us in Krishna consciousness. Even though I'd like to give up my household life and take sannyas, give away my wealth and everything else, I, I just can't do it. I, there's still attachments there. Um. The amazing thing for all of us, for all of us, is that what we all don't give up, we'll give us up. <laughs> <laughs> That's the fact. I was talking to a Prabhupada disciple. He's, he must be about 68 now and just about to retire from his engineering job. All his kids, four kids are all married, got grandchildren. And so he's talking about, I gotta get back into it, gotta get back into the devotional service. Uh, so I said, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, why not? Uh, uh, you can live near the Los Angeles Temple and. <clears throat> He used to do service for the BBT, accounting service. You can do that again. Said, yeah, yeah, I can get back into that. I don't need the money. I can just serve for free. But then he and his wife were talking. But we're so accustomed to living in our huge five-bedroom house surrounded by four acres. What are we going to do? <laughs> I said, well, what are you going to do? It's quite simple. Either you give it up or it gives you up. <laughs> <laughs> How can we, how can we give up our five-bedroom house, bedrooms to spare for when the grandchildren visit us? <laughs> <laughs> Surrounded by four acres, we can look out the window and just see grass and trees. How can we give it up to live in a small apartment in Los Angeles? So I said, um, not only will it give you up, but also. As you're aging, as the body's deteriorating, it uh, doesn't matter whether you're in a big house or a small house. <laughs> and the body's breaking down, it's breaking down. <laughs> so I can see, I remember as a young devotee in the 70s, reading Bhagavad Gita in the second chapter, Srila Prabhupada writes that certainly taking sannyas is a painstaking affair. And I was always wondering, what does that mean? Because back then, you know, everyone was taking sannyas when they were in their 20s and 30s. <laughs> 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 yeah. What does he mean by it? it's a painstaking affair? Of course, later I could understand that it's natural when you're older to want more and more comforts. You, you want, hmm, you're more and more attached to the creature comforts. So therefore, the Vedic system goes against that. <laughs> it pulls you out of that. And it can be very painful to, when you're in your 60s, to just abandon all your creature comforts, abandon the so-called security, and just venture out. So now I understand. I remember in one Vyasa Pujo offering, his whole his Shivaram Marjorie, about how he met an elderly man in the UK. It was like in his mid-70s. And it was a non devotee But the man told him, the man knew something about Prabhupada. And the man told him at that time, yes, 
Dr. Ron Rogers in his 50s. You don't understand. You will never understand what your Prabhupada did. You don't know what it's like to be in your 70s and then try to do something with no support, with no security. You don't know. <laughs>
And I explained to him, in this way, Lee's would be able to pick up your sadhana, which you've let slip for about 30 years. Yeah, I said, yeah, I should do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't know. To give up that big house. <laughs> Rooms for the grandchildren. They come. <laughs> it's tough. I, I can appreciate it. It's tough. <laughs> and you can appreciate it, but it's tough. The bats are there. Hmm? The bats are there. Hmm. When we were younger, the boys, we were probably laughed at such a Oh, you're just attached. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> but now we can understand. That's why it's so important for intelligent young men. When I say intelligent, I mean forward thinking young men to have brahmachari training because in the future they'll be able to fall back on that after they've been, uh, after they go through household life. They'll be able to remember. There was a time in my life when I didn't have these complications. I did it before, I can do it again. That's why the Vedic system is so brilliant. So an intelligent young man thinks, let me get some years of a brahmachari life under my belt, so to speak. So in that way, I can always have in the future, no matter what ashram I'm in, I can always remember how I did live very simply. Because after all, you come into this world with nothing, you leave with nothing. <laughs> so it is a tragedy that we don't have facilities. We're not able to facilitate Grihastas who have actually stayed together all their life, that is a great accomplishment. And we can't facilitate yet their retirement. Because naturally, as I said, the husband is thinking, I've been married to this woman for 30 years, and now she'll just walk out the door, what happens to her? Often there's not an oldest son to take care of like the classic dating system. If there is an oldest son, he hasn't yet, you know, come in for a landing in terms of his bhakti. <laughs> and so, the man is rightfully concerned. How do I apply this? And then, of course, if one has multiple marriages, it gets even more complicated. <laughs> Whenever I'm speaking, like with Bada uh, I've known his wife and him since they were, mar were married, since she was 16. Uh, and so he always tells me when, when someone says to him, It's amazing, you two have been together for, you've been married for 30 years, it's amazing. He says, Yes. And to the same life. <laughs> Touch wood. <laughs> so there are all these considerations which we have to take into account. We don't just fanatically just, you know, apply these Vedic injunctions. In an insensitive way. Nevertheless, the basic thrust has to be accepted. We make our move, or time moves on us. <laughs> that was Madura's point to Duras. Anything else? Yes. Well, I would like to that 48 minutes you were telling Krishna Chakravarti that in Srila Rishna Chakravarti Thakur is always giving these details. He has the vision. <laughs> I am just repeating. Okay. <laughs> how can how can the living entity see oneself being equal 
with everyone else being one with everyone. How can the living entity be upset? How can the living entity be equal with everyone else or see everyone else as being equal with Oh, that can only be done on the spiritual platform because materially there's no equality. There's no physical equality, there's no intellectual equality, there's no so-called equality before the law. That's what they say in democratic countries. Everyone's equal before the law. Right, so it depends on how much money you have to, to pay a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> the one with the best lawyer <laughs> wins. So, equality can only be on the spiritual platform. That means we're all equal as servants of God. <laughs> In our constitutional position, we are all equal. <clears throat> In our original constitutional position, everyone is Krishna's servant. Ekale Iswara Krishna Arsava Bridja. There's only one controller, Krishna. Everyone else is his servant. And no matter what rasa you have with Krishna, there is the Dasha Prem element there, even in Madhuras, Vaksayaras, Sakyaras. Still, there's an element of servitorship. That's what Krishna's covers in the song explains in Chaitanya Charitamrita. Yes? Um, so, we're talking about that, the um, household life being complications and ending up starting, in, say, from Chari and and then ending up having to renounce again. Why go through the household life? You're asking me. <laughs> 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 what should I say? <laughs> <laughs> On the one hand, it is true. Why go in, why enter into a situation which you're only going to have to give up? On the other hand, though, you see living entities have their propensities. They have these bodies which they have been inhabiting lifetime after lifetime. And those bodies have inclinations, how to deal with those inclinations in a constructive way so that purification can come about. So wouldn't having to observe, for example, at least 99% of all ladies want to marry? And sooner or later. What's that? Sooner or later. say at least 90% of men want to marry. So there's no point arguing why. <laughs> so how to facilitate all that so that spiritual advancement can go on. In this way, the Vedic system is practical. It's recognizing that there are inclinations. How to deal with that so people can be Krishna conscious and make progress. The whole point is to make progress. Whatever ashram you're in. All the ashrams are meant for spiritual advancement, whether they live that way or not. But, as I often explain, especially when I'm speaking to a room full of brahmacharis, which I'm not, but as I often explain, all the ashrams are meant for spiritual advancement, it's just that some ashrams are cheaper than others. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> because generally, ladies want things, right? Right? <laughs> They're not just going to, you know, just stay put and just not want anything. And generally, they look to the man as a mechanism for providing. Even if the lady has money herself, she's looking to the man as someone who can fight the world on her behalf and arrange the world and make it a nice place. That's just the way nature is not. Generally, ladies expect a man to sort the world out for the lady. Make everything nice, make it a pleasant place. Which is an impossible job to make this world a pleasant place. Make the world emotionally warm and fulfilling. Make it so there are no obstacles. And generally, nice house, nice children, and everything should happen nice with the children too. That's a lot of work. <laughs> It takes money. So how can this all go on in such a way that devotees can make spiritual advancement? Therefore, Srila Prabhupada made a classic statement. A paradox. He's highlighting a paradox. He said, every woman should marry and every man should remain brahmacharya. <laughs> so what does that mean? Something's got to give, and it does. <laughs> but the ideal is that every woman should have a nice partner, and every man should be unencumbered and free. But in reality, it's just not going to be that way. So how to arrange, to accommodate the psycho-physical inclinations of both genders so that they can make spiritual progress. Because you have to be progressive in your spiritual life. So many times we see that devotees, when they first begin bhakti, they're convinced, I'll go it alone. And ladies will say, no, I'll, I'm not married. I've had my share of that, forget it. But as years go by, <laughs> there isn't changes of it. So how do we? work with all that so they can still make spiritual advancement. <coughs> so therefore, we have four ashrams. Okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs>